<clears throat> okay. So uh, it's the second uh, installment of our series on uh, learning new hymns for us to sing to enhance our worship. Um, just to quickly recap on our goals, um, we did this the last time around. We had a fairly brief reminder um, about sung worship and about its importance um, in the life of the church. You may remember we also uh, dipped into uh, John Wesley's instructions to uh, his congregation, or congregations perhaps, um, as to how they should sing, and uh, that they needed to be attentive, that they needed to sing uh, all of the words, not modify them, and uh, above everything else, to sing to the Lord. And uh, then, can anybody still remember the title of the first hymn that we learned? <laughs> tricky question. The uh, love song of the Welsh revival from 1904. Here is love, vast as the ocean, loving kindness as the flood. And uh, I think we've already sung that at least once in our main worship, which is good. And we'll be singing, God willing, the hymn that we're going to learn this evening in our morning worship this coming Sunday, so that we'll get another opportunity to, uh, to sing it through then. And uh, hopefully that will enhance our uh, sung worship. Um, it's always good to have new things to sing and new tunes uh, to sing them to, provided, of course, that those words are edifying. <clears throat> so. This is the hymn that we're going to be learning this week. Oh, what matchless condescension. Um, how many people know this hymn? Okay. <laughs> Kathy, sort of. Okay, Jerry's read it. Ty kind of knows it, I guess, because Kathy's been playing it somewhat. Written by a gentleman called uh, William Gadsby. And uh, here he is, born 1773 at a place called Attleborough in Warwickshire. Um, he only was able to attend school briefly and uh, then began work as a ribbon weaver. So he had very little formal education. And by the time he reached the age of 17, he had completely forgotten pretty much everything that he learned, including how to read. But it was when he was 17 that he was converted. And uh, this is uh, part of his testimony. When the Lord was graciously pleased to quicken my soul, being then just 17 years of age, and showed me something of what sin really was, I really feared it then, and a turn in my mind took place of a very different kind. I was then solemnly and blessedly led to believe in God's free mercy and pardon. And uh, he joined the Cowlane Baptist Church in Coventry and was baptized 1793. He first preached five years later, and I imagine his preaching must have met with a good deal of acceptance uh, because they built a chapel especially for him to preach in um, two years later. And they built another chapel two years after that, so um, I don't know how many people have had two chapels built in the space of four years. Um, in the Leicester area. Um, Hinckley is in Leicestershire as well. And uh, so he became a minister in the Baptist Church. In 1814 then, he 
produced a hymn book um, called Gadda's Hymnal, I think. And uh, he wrote of the reason why he produced this. It was because he wanted to have a selection of hymns free from Arminianism and sound in the faith that the church might be edified and God glorified. Um, he had already, by that time, moved to Manchester and uh, was over a somewhat larger congregation. And I think he finished his time uh, ministering in that particular fellowship, um, during which time he traveled 60,000 miles, uh, from what I gather, most of that, if not all of it, on foot, um, preaching in barns and cottages and homes around the city, uh, preached up to well, probably about nine times every week in various locations, and uh, had a tremendous local influence, um, particularly in teaching Bible um, knowledge to the young people. <coughs> Now, in 1824, to follow up the hymnal that was a selection, it had over a thousand hymns in of ver by various authors, he produced a book <coughs> called The Nazarene's Songs, um, which contained 269 hymns that he himself had written. And uh, <coughs> this is what he says in the preface to that hymnal. Believe these hymns will be found to contain sound doctrine and true Christian experience. And as such, if my dear Lord should condescend to grant his blessing to attend them, they may be useful to some poor souls who have been led into the same track which the Lord has led the author. And should any of them be made a blessing to any branch of God's dear family, I shall esteem it a great honor conferred on me by the Lord of the house, and hope he will influence my mind to give him the whole of the praise. For I trust it is my highest ambition to crumble to nothing at his feet and crown him Lord of all. Uh, none of his hymns, I checked this out, none of his hymns sadly seem to have made it into our Trinity hymnal. Um, two of them are thought by many, I believe, to be the best that he wrote. Um, one of those is entitled, Immortal Honors Rest on Jesus' Head. And uh, that's another one that we'll be learning um, in due course. And then there is the one that we're going to tackle um, this evening. Oh, what matchless condescension. So hopefully that's given you a flavor for the author and for his motivation in writing hymns. And um, just a, a taste of his character and the circumstances of his life, which I think is quite helpful to know sometimes when you are dealing with hymns. So then, here is uh, the first verse of his hymn. Oh, what matchless condescension the eternal God displays, claiming our supreme attention to his boundless works and ways. His own glory he reveals in gospel days. And I thought we'd just go through pretty much as we did last time and pick out some of the salient uh, phrases just to clue us into uh, to what this hymn um, is about so that we can sing it more intelligently. Um, firstly, the phrase matchless condescension. Um, what does condescension mean? Excuse me? To bring low. It, yes, if I'm condescending towards you, is that a good thing? What does it mean I am doing? 
talking down to you, not talking to you as an equal, but to as an inferior. Um, and another one would be? Right, I think um, there are many things that are not good traits to see in man, but are perfectly um, acceptable and indeed wonderful in the case of God. same level and for us for one to condescend in speaking to another is inappropriate God however is far above us and if he speaks to us at all it has to be condescending it can't be any other way what is the condescension that the hymn writer has in view here though I'm not sure it's just the, the speaking part of the idea the incarnation of Christ, Christ coming down from heaven to earth. Um, and what kind of condescension is that? <laughs> it's matchless. Can you think of any other condescension, any other event in the whole of recorded history that even begins to compare to the Son of God taking flesh and being made in the likeness of sinful man. Um, it's absolutely matchless condescension, as, uh, as he says. Okay, and what does it call for? The fact that God sent his son into this world. Our attention. Uh, what kind of chunk of our attention? 10%? Yes, our supreme attention. God has done something so remarkable, so wonderful, that it should claim our entire focus and our attention. It is worthy of it. It deserves to be given no less than that. Um, his works and his ways in sending Christ into this earth are boundless. And one other phrase to think about <clears throat> is gospel days. So from this verse, what do you think is on the heart of the hymn writer? What's he trying to get us to focus on and to meditate on um, throughout this hymn. There may be more than one thing as well. Okay, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ and the result of that Okay. There is the gospel, which is, of course, the good news of salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the result of that? Forgiveness, yes? His own glory he reveals in gospel days. So I think we'll see this as we go through. This entire hymn is about how God reveals his glory supremely in Christ coming to earth as a man in order to save fallen sinners. Uh, so that sets the tone. And uh, it's, uh, it's a glorious theme. Um, you might tremble to attempt to write a hymn like this, but I think Gadsby does a pretty remarkable job, as we'll see. So let's go on to the second verse. 
Now he's starting to focus on his subject, Christ, and uh, what he reveals to us. Okay, it's about a revelation of God in the gospel, which is to the glory of God. Um, all the majesty of Christ, of God, sorry, is seen in the Savior. The His here is God the Father. This is the interplay in this hymn. All His majesty um, is seen in Christ. And I, as before, what I like to try and do when I'm working through hymns or singing hymns is to try and find scriptures that the hymn writer may have had in mind in writing the hymn, or that certainly underpin the hymn. And um, it's a useful way uh, to use scripture and also to test the hymn and make sure that it's sound. Colossians 2 verse 9, Paul says, <clears throat> For in him, in Christ, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, which I think is close to what the hymn writer is saying uh, in those first two lines. Now, whoops, wait a minute, I need to go back. Love and justice shine forever. How is that true? As we're looking at, he's, he's now pulled our attention to Christ, where we see all the majesty of the Father. And he's saying that as we look at him, we should see love and justice shining out and shining out eternally. How is that true? How do love and justice shine out from the Lord Jesus Christ? So he, uh, yeah, he, he demonstrated love in that he came. God's love was demonstrated in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us on the cross. And in going to the cross, Christ upheld the justice of God. There could be no salvation. Uh, there could be no forgiveness unless an adequate price was paid to satisfy the justice of God. And that is what Jesus did. Now, um, then he talks about uh, without a veil between, we approach him and rejoice in his dear name. So we're beholding him, love and justice are shining forth, and there is no veil between that stops us from approaching him. So what's the hymn writer got in mind here? Maybe two things. Jerry. Right. There was no way in. Yeah, there was no way in to the Holy of Holies, to the very presence of God. And uh, that's what the writer to the Hebrews says here in chapter 10, verses 19 to 22. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. <clears throat> so the veil was taken out of the way. Um, when Christ died upon the cross, you remember how that curtain, as Jerry was saying, was torn in two? That was a representation of his body, broken. And in the breaking of his body, 
the way was opened up for us to enter into the holy place. Um, but I think, I think certainly he has that in mind because he's talking about approaching him. And that's here, let us draw near. And he's talked about the veil being taken out of the way. But there's another scripture as well which talks about a slightly different aspect um, that I think may be in the hymn writer's mind as well. And that's in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, verses 7 through 18. It talks about how Moses used to enter the presence of God in the tent of meeting outside the camp of Israel. And he would come out, if you remember, and he would still have a residual glory about him. Uh, which was unnerving to the Israelites. And so he used to put a veil on until that glory had completely faded away. And what the writer is, here is doing is comparing the glory of the Old Covenant, which was based on the law and the Ten Commandments, <clears throat> and was fading away, with the greater glory of the New Covenant. And uh, he talks here about... Um, the veil being removed in Christ. Uh, their minds were hardened. You know, whenever <clears throat> the Old Testament was read, a veil came over their hearts so that they couldn't see and understand these things. They couldn't see Christ in them. Uh, but in Christ, that veil is removed. To this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And then look at this. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. And I think, I think the hymn writer may have had both of these things in mind, but he's talking, remember, about how the glory of God is revealed in the coming of Christ. And so the reference is here to having an unveiled face and beholding the glory, I think, is um, probably in his thinking as well as the access that we have through Christ into God's presence. <clears throat> would we view his highest glory? Here it shines in Jesus' face. Sing and tell the pleasing story, O ye sinners saved by grace. And with pleasure bid the guilty him embrace. So, <clears throat> why does he say that the highest glory of God shines in Jesus' face. We want to see the highest glory of God, then we ought to look to the Lord Jesus Christ. Can we think of a scripture that might underpin that? Maybe from Hebrews. Yeah, I think that's all uh, appropriate. It's difficult when you don't have a Bible to, uh, to call it back. But yes, we haven't come to a mount that can be touched, but we've come to Mount Zion and so on and so forth. Shall I give you a clue? <laughs> Hebrews chapter 1, about how God, having spoken in through many... Uh, through the prophets in many portions and in many ways in the past. In these last days has spoken to us through his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he is the radiance. What does something that's radiant do? 
shines of God's glory. He is the outshining of the glory of God and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he'd made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, and so on. <clears throat> so we can do no better if we want to study the glory of God, which is, remember this hymn, is about the revelation of the glory of God, which he gave when Christ came to earth. Looking at Christ is the best we can do. There is no brighter outshining of the glory of God. Kathy. Right. Right. That's, <clears throat> yeah, hold that thought because I think he may be about to come to that in the next verse. But that, it's here too. We couldn't have known God um, had Jesus, we couldn't have known him so well had Jesus, and so fully had Jesus not come. Um, we can know him in creation. Um, and we can know quite a lot about him in creation. But we know so much more about our God because Jesus came. Um, so yes, that is also uh, his, to his glory. Now, um, sing and tell the pleasing story. Is this a pleasing story? <laughs> Is there a more pleasing story? Uh, well, not for God's children. Um, it's, it's not a pleasing story for those who are his enemies. Um, right now, this is nonsense to them, a stumbling block. Um, but ultimately, this is the, the story of the one who came once to be the savior of the world and will come again to be the judge. So, uh, not a pleasing story for those who do not love the Lord Jesus Christ, but for us who know him and love him, um, who are sinners saved by grace, um, this is the best story there is. And uh, part of what we are to do is to invite others to come and know this same glory that has been revealed to us in Christ. And to do that with pleasure as well. It's a pleasing story. And uh, we are to, to bid the guilty to embrace Christ, and, and that should be a pleasure to us also. Okay, let's move on to the fourth verse. Um, in his highest work, redemption, see his glory in a blaze, nor can angels ever mention aught that more of God displays. Grace and justice here unite to endless days. Why is redemption the highest work of God? Why is his glory here seen in a blaze? Excuse me? Okay, good. Who else could have done it? What does it, what does it reveal to us about God, redemption? It's one word, let's unpack it. Love. Sacrifice uh, as an expression of that love. <coughs> Kathy was saying grace, mercy, justice. These things would not have been revealed to us. This is to go back to what Kathy was saying earlier on. Had Jesus not come, um, 
and his glory is in a blaze here. His, you know, his justice is seen. He's not letting anybody off. A price has to be paid. But his love is seen because he doesn't exact the price from those who ought to pay it, but from the son of his love who had no sin. Um, and I love this next verse. This, these are worth thinking about, the lines of this hymn. The, the author thought about them a lot. Is there anything that angels can talk about that says more about God than the subject of redemption? And if so, what would that be? Why is it if you are an angel, or come to that if you're a saint, here tonight, and you want to really say something that is, you, you, we all, we're all familiar with the word ought. It's anything, okay? Angels cannot mention anything that displays more of God than when they're talking about this theme of redemption, and neither can we. Why is that? It's the same reason that we've already, you know, just even without plumbing the depths of this, we talked about grace, mercy, love, justice. Um, so much of God, so many of his attributes seen in this one act of buying sinners back to himself at the cost of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, grace and justice here unite to endless days. Uh, these phrases also take a little bit of thinking about. God's unmerited favor and justice, how can those two things happen? How can God be just and the justifier of him who believes? Only by sending someone else who is perfect to pay that price. And then grace and justice are not separated anymore. They're united in this theme of redemption. There's no other way that they could be brought together. Think about it. Let's move on to this last verse, which really sums it up. That he's, he's, he's laid out his theme in these first four verses. It's the coming of Christ. It's the revealing of the glory of God. There's nothing, there's nowhere where his glory is seen so brightly. There is no, you know, angels can't talk about anything that displays more of God than when they talk about this theme of redemption. And that is a sweet and solemn pleasure. To see God uh, to, in the Lord Jesus Christ, to see the glory of God, as we've seen, shining out from Christ, because he's the exact representation of his nature. Here, in this act of redemption, and in this gospel, he smiles and he smiles forever. May my soul his name record, praise and bless him, and his wonders spread abroad. For as many as are the promises of God in him, in Jesus, they are yes. Therefore also through him is our Amen to the glory of God through us. So that's the content of the hymn. I love this hymn. Um, and uh, now we can actually sing it, perhaps. Um, can we get the, do we have the words that we could project up on the, the screen? And um, then we can figure out the tune. Let me, I'll just show you, I've got the tune here. Oh no, okay. There we are. That's, 
That's uh, the tune for the musicians amongst us. Um, but Kathy will actually play it through for us once, and then uh, are we close to getting the words up from? Ah, okay. I have to change something here. Okay, so Kathy, if you would play the tune through once and then we'll stand and we'll try and sing this hymn. 